I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I wanted to respond first to a question that came in. Rick, when the isolation of COVID feels like there's been a certain loss of the brain's ability to handle new information, is that a case of use it or lose it? Or can we regrow those brain synapses that feel more hidden or even lost now? Really interesting question. So several things here. First, um, the experience of loneliness, which is not inherent in isolation, but is a very common feature of isolation and certainly has been a very common experience during this plague that we've all been living through now, pushing three years roughly, or we're on the way now. Um, Loneliness itself can change the brain in problematic ways, including creating a kind of fogginess um, in, our, in our brain. So that's one thing to be kind of thoughtful about loneliness. Also, uh, one of the effects of long COVID, uh, I'm not saying that, Margaret, you're talking about that. You spoke of just isolation, but many people who've gone through COVID report longstanding issues for weeks, months, even longer, especially if they were already maybe vulnerable by being older or unvaccinated, um, that you know one of those symptoms is a kind of mental clouding. That has a physical basis to it. I just want to acknowledge that and encourage you to be aware of the growing information about long COVID, even for people who did not get put into a hospital and yet are still being really affected by this thing and scientists are gradually trying to figure it out and figure out what to do about it. So that's that part. And then more broadly, here's the good news. The brain has this amazing capacity over the lifespan to make new connections, grow new neurons, and reclaim capacities that may have been lost. And very often when we start actually going back to things that we feel foggy about or you know, less capable than we used to be, um, we're able to get back in the saddle, to get back to become pretty good at it again. And I encourage you to keep trying. Now, there are two things that really stand out uh, for me when I think about rehabilitating my own brain or uh, encouraging you know, other people. The first is physical activity. Boy, oh boy, Uh, physical activity promotes neurogenesis. Uh, It does other good things in the brain. It promotes just the uh, new stimulation in terms of the things that we do when we're physically active, like going for a walk with a friend. Um, Physical activity is a very fundamental way to take good care of our brain and expanding it. You know, it's so easy, I speak from experience, to become a couch potato. Uh, I'm kind of a fairly skinny couch potato, but I have tendencies there to just want to plop and read and, you know, just kind of space out, meditate and so forth. It's really important to get moving. Uh, uh, The book Go Wild or Spark, both by um, Edward Ratey, who's a psychiatrist and professor at Harvard Medical School, just wonderful material, Spark and Go Wild two good book titles, are really uh, a lot about the the value of physical activity. And as someone who's come late in life to actually getting fit um, or trying to, um, I can certainly uh, warrant the power of this myself. The other really important brain factor is playfulness. Playfulness, being playful, having a certain creativity. It's so easy to get grim. And, you know, to sort of to grind it out, boring, same old, same old, oh well, each day, kind of the same. It's really important to bring novelty in, to bring a certain playful spirit, to do things that are new for yourself, um, to be open to things like, uh, you know, young people, music, the arts, old people, wisdom, just a playfulness and to bring a kind of deliberate joie de vivre. Now, that doesn't mean that you fake it till you make it. If actually your mood is a little depressed and you're kind of grim about the state of the world, it means an authentic lightness, holding life lightly 
an authentic openness to creativity, uh, a refusal to be cowed and bowed by the forces that want to suppress people and make them feel despairing and helpless and give up and instead um, hang in there, right? And keep getting in touch wherever you can in the parts of your life with a kind of playful spirit. Playfulness supports what's called neurotrophic factors in your brain that are chemical processes that protect your brain and actually promote new connections and they help uh, st cells uh, in your brain stay healthy. Um, so playfulness. Anyway, those, those would be two. And there's, there's plenty of hope, right? Uh, even uh, toward the end of life, uh, people, many people keep their minds fairly alive and, and open, even if you know, they don't remember things as well as they used to. So I wanted to say that uh, in response to, um, to what Margaret brought up there. Hang in there, right? And as I quote Neil Young, keep on rocking in the free world, or at least try to, okay? So I want to offer a talk tonight about the profound power of simply widening your view. And we're going to apply that in a variety of areas. And as I talk about widening your view, I'm going to drop in some micro experiential practice here so you can get kind of a feeling of what I'm talking about. This is a topic that includes both Psychology 101, basic, useful, practical information in psychology, all the way out to the depths of the Buddha's wisdom about awakening. And it's also uh, been, for me, an extremely useful, personally useful practice that has changed for me uh, a lot as I became aware of this, including the grounding in the brain of what happens when we widen our view. All right, so here we go. Uh, why don't you start just as an experiment with being aware of the physical setting you're in, right? And Tom, I think you should mute your microphone. Oh, there you are, okay, good. So think of the physical setting you're in. What happens when you look around? And also, if you have more of a sense of the volume of the space you're in. You might notice that simply doing this, an awareness of the room or area that you're in right now affects you. How does it affect you? You might put comments in the chat if you like. Uh, typically, what people report is there is a sense of calming that can happen, especially if we're if we've been you know upset about something, worried or irritated. There's a calming that does tend to come in when we get a sense of the whole space that we're in. Um, another common report, in addition to what I'm already seeing coming in on the um, uh, in the chat is less sense of taking things so personally. The sense of self-preoccupation tends to decline as we just get a sense of the room we're in. Neurologically, which will be a recurring theme, the sense of things as a whole affects your brain in, some, in several useful ways. It tends to engage the right hemisphere of the cortex for people who are right-handed. This is sort of switched for most left-handed people or many of them certainly, but the idea is the same. And what that means is that we can move out of that inner chatter, you know, the voice in the back of the head that is criticizing us or uh, worrying about something or going over and over about a kind of a accusation against another person, boom, as soon as you're aware of the whole room, you're in your right hemisphere which is quieter. It's less engaged with verbal activity, generally not at all. And um, that itself can be quite a relief. Second, as we engage the right hemisphere with a sense of, oh, the room, just the room as a whole, 
that tends to quiet activity in the midline of the cortex because now we've moved out to the right side. And the midline of the cortex is very involved with self-preoccupations, whether it's task-oriented focus in the front portions of the midline or the spacing out, mind-wandering uh, aspects of the default uh, network toward the middle and rear of the, um, of the brain. Just that. You might notice, oh, wow. Just there you are. Maybe if you're really perhaps caught up in some kind of very taking life personally, personally reaction, just look around your room and even get a sense of the volume of the room as a whole, the whole space of the room. Right? Wow, pretty wild. Third in your brain, and these will be recurring themes as we go forward here, uh, if you tend to be aware of the room altogether, which by the way, it does not matter if it's visually pleasing per se, because you're, you're aware of it as a whole. And as you become aware of the room, your gaze often tends to move out to the horizon line from looking down at your, you know, your papers, your keyboard, your immediate preoccupation, which promotes a self-referential egocentric point of view. Um, when you are aware of the room as a whole, the gaze naturally moves up and even out. And what that does in your brain is it starts engaging these, what are called allocentric or their ancient uh, ways of perceiving reality that are more impersonal and take things as a whole, rather than privileging the perspective of me, myself, and I. The details of this, I actually document in my book, Neurodharma. You can see references. Um, you can even you know, search this out yourself online. It's not hocus pocus what I'm talking about, but most fundamentally, notice what you feel in your own direct experience when you widen your view to just to be aware of your setting. Okay, really cool, right? In just a few seconds and no one can stop you. They don't even need to know you're doing it as you widen your view. All right, let's try a second one. How about widening your view to be aware of your body as a whole? So I'll be quiet for a few breaths as you explore what is it like to get a sense of your body as a whole. Can imagine sort of widening the spotlight of attention to include your body as a whole. Here too, you might have a similar sense of a kind of calming and a sense of being in life, taking it less personally. With also, interestingly, a reassuring feeling of the livingness, the organic livingness of the animal body. Still here, still breathing, as a nonverbal knowing, because the focusing on the sensations in your body as a whole um, takes you out again of verbal chatter. There's a place for verbal chatter. I chatter for a living in some ways. Um, but words are secondary. What's primary is nonverbal experience. Most of the brain is devoted to nonverbal processing really matters. And sensations and, and, and spending a few breaths to focus on sensations naturally, you know, is quieting. You might notice that. If your mind wanders, it's okay. You can come back, right? Huh. Widening to include the body as a whole. There's some bonus benefits too, because if, like me, 
you've been embarrassed about parts of your body or, you know, you've tuned them out or, uh, you know, not wanted to think about them even, when you're aware of your body as a whole, that promotes self-acceptance. Nice bonus, right? That's implicit in widening awareness to include your body as a whole. All right. Let's try a, a third one. Third one. A little more psychological, a little more complicated, uh, but we we'll keep trying to make it simple. What about widening awareness to include your mind as a whole, which includes body sensations and everything else? So you might take a moment to have a sense of widening. In mindfulness training, is called open awareness. So all of what it is to be you in the present, in terms of consciousness, the whole field of consciousness, the whole stream of consciousness, is accepted and included. Instead of fixating on one part after another, there's a sense of the whole of consciousness, which includes many things. As soon as you start labeling it or thinking about it, you're getting caught up in a part. That's okay. Go back out to the whole field. And this full acceptance of all of you includes sensations, sounds, thoughts, impulses. It includes, you know, nasty, creepy thoughts and impulses, beautiful, loving feelings. It just includes it all. It's all there. It's all okay. Just whew, one hole. What happens when you widen in this way? You might notice that the process of going out to, in the broadest sense of the word, mind as a whole, in which one small part is intellect, but it's your totality of conscious, your consciousness as a whole. When you do that, suffering tends to immediately get quieter because so much of our suffering is grounded in, grounded in the structure of one part of us struggling with another part. You know, one part wants the cherry pie the other part says, no, you don't get cherry pie. Bad for you. Third part comes in, says, you know, I saw the movie Starman many years ago, and he loved cherry pie a la mode. Yeah, what? You know, all these parts, boom, boom, boom. But when you go out to the hole, there's a single hole that includes all the parts. And when you're out at the single hole, no inner conflict. You're not struggling. And it can feel incredibly peaceful. A related aspect of mind as a whole is more, I could say, vertical. So horizontal, as it were, we're including everything in consciousness. It's all there, it's okay. Widen to include. And also we could vertically Welcome, whatever might be bubbling up from the interior, including maybe things we've pushed down, kept at bay. We can open to intuition bubbling up. Whoa, we can widen to include younger parts of ourselves, passionate parts of ourselves, uh, powerful parts of ourselves. Uh, we can open to include painful past feelings that have been pushed down or locked away in some basement room in the mansion of the mind. It's all right. We can widen our view. It helps to support yourself, to tolerate whatever might be bubbling up. And still, in this more vertical way, we can open to whatever could be arising from the depths of your interior. That's another kind of widening. 
What's that like? Maybe nothing comes up, but just to have an openness and a, and a and welcoming, you know. When you have that kind of welcoming spirit to your own depths, they like you more. <laughs> they, they, they feel invited, like we all feel when we're welcome. How do you feel when you're welcomed into a gathering or a situation? Uh, or maybe you are nervous about being welcomed and yet you actually are being welcomed. Oh, it's comforting, it's nice, it really brings us in. So in much the same way, just the invitation, even if nothing comes, even if no one shows up, or nothing in particular bubbles up, that attitude of invitation and openness and acceptance to your own depths, widening to include your depths, what a beautiful thing. A radical hospitality. Very nice, Larry. And as Mary Quillen says, um, curiosity is our companion. Exactly right. Okay, so far? All right. And you can see the value already of these different kinds of widening. Your setting, um, your body as a whole, and your mind as a whole, both kind of horizontally, the different aspects of consciousness, and vertically to include your own depths. So let's try something else. Let's try another form of widening your view. Pick a situation that you're dealing with. Could be a relationship, a situation. Just take a moment, not to get all caught up in problem solving, but just imagine it looking at it from a bird's eye view. So right now I'm thinking about a project I'm working on and you might be thinking about, you know, a conflict with somebody. From a bird's eye view, can you widen your perspective rather than contracting around positions and uh, possessiveness, uh, holding on to your view or getting really pressured or attached to certain results or blaming others in certain ways? widening to include all of it, all the factors that are involved, all the voices, all the people, all the forces. Huh. In the present and stretching back into the past that are part of this uh, situation or issue. You can see their part. If it's another person, you can see your part. You can see the effects of third parties. You could see societal forces, structural forces, including oppressive forces of poverty, injustice, racism. You just see the whole wide picture. You can see it stretching back in time. What happens when you regard a, a challenging situation or relationship or relationship in this very wide view? Yeah. Like uh, Carolyn's iPhone, during tricky times, I imagine the view of an eagle soaring high above. Okay. This does this wide view first is not the only view. Sometimes we zero in. We, we bring the microscope to bear. We bring the telescope. We really focus on a particular thing. There's a place for that. Close analytic attention. Fine. And we can often get sucked into that close focused view and leave out so many other things in the context, in the big picture. So when we move out to this wide view, what often happens is that it's, it feels more peaceful for some of the neurological reasons that I've already named. We have this kind of panoramic perspective. Uh, we have a sense of spaciousness, all of it does good stuff in your brain. 
Additionally, when we go to this wider view, we often see things that are useful. Aha, <laughs> no wonder they're irritated <laughs> with me. <laughs> oh, or, oh wow, I can now get it, given that they're that kind of a person with that sort of history who's been mistreated in those sorts of ways. Aha, I can understand why they didn't like that word I used. That makes sense, I can use that better. Or I can realize, whoa, big picture, I'm out here alone facing a whole huge problem. I need more resources, I need more help, I need more allies, I need more time, I need more money to deal with this, I need something. Um, you know, we get lots of good information when we widen our view to include everything. All right. Okay. Also, I would have to say last, when we are dealing with other people with whom maybe there's an issue, if they have a sense that, let's say, you are very stuck in your position and you're looking at the situation with blinders on, with tunnel vision, how are they likely to react? Not that well, probably. Just like we don't react that well when people come at us, you know, with a very narrow view. Nu, nu, nu. So when we interact with other people with a wide view that takes into account many, many things while still protecting our own self-interest as appropriate, it's more likely to go well. They're more likely to be open and receptive. You might think very specifically about a wrangle that's recurring or a kind of a stuckness in an important relationship and how it might help you to really take more into account, to widen your view from a bird's eye view, big picture for the situation and this person, their history, the forces, everything. Okay. Here's another one. I'm gonna do a couple more here and then we'll open it up for discussion. How about widening your view to your life as a whole, this chapter in the history of the universe. <laughs> if we're really, really fortunate, we might get 100 years. That's a nice round number. And that 100 years, while it's happening, can seem like a pretty long time. Certain experiences can just seem like a really long time, all right? But you can realize, wow, the I'm gonna use the metaphor of the ocean, right? So reality as the ocean, okay? And when you were born, whoop, the causes and conditions in reality, broadly, um, certainly in planet Earth, whoop, manifested as you. Suddenly there was a new wave <laughs> in the whole wide sea, right? Great, you were born, how cool is that? New wave, yay, which have particular qualities. A little bit of seaweed here, a little bit of foam there, certain aspects, maybe a mama and a papa wave alongside kind of guiding, maybe just a mama wave or something, but there you are. And then for roughly, let's say 100 years, your wave happens. It has some continuity to it. Uh, things happen, it's influenced by other waves. It, influences them in turn of other waves. And eventually at a certain point, whoosh, it subsides back into the sea of reality altogether, the ocean in which it arose. While all the while its nature along the way was water. That's your life. That's my life. That's the life of all 419 people right now present in this uh, gathering here. Uh, so what's it like for you to kind of step back and to um, recognize the past stretching backwards, thousands, millions, billions of years, and then the future stretching forward on the other side of this chapter, this span of the continuity of that particular wave, right? Stretching forward in time. 
wow, <laughs> that's a really wide view, right? In terms of time, especially. And what happens when you take that wide view? You know, different things happen to different people. Uh, I can tell you two that happened for me. And they're present for me also when I regard other waves, including the waves of you right now, whose faces I can see here in this gathering. Um, the first of the two is lightening up, holding it lightly, uh, recognizing that, wow, all the things that seem so incredibly important in this particular life, they're just part of a big universe unfolding, including in just this kind of local backwater, third rock from the sun planet we have in a circling a mediocre standard sun twirling around the outer perimeter of a basic humdrum boring galaxy amidst another trillion or two trillion other galaxies in the whole universe. You know, like lighten up, have fun. Don't take it too seriously. You know, and there's a kind of lightness about it and a, a, not an indifference or a sense of futility and defeat, but more just a, whew, does it all, a lot of stuff we think matters a lot. Does it really all matter that much? And if it doesn't matter that all much, you know, Focus on what you care about and have a good time meanwhile, kind of like. There's that aspect, at least for me. Um, a lightening up, not taking it too seriously. And then second, there's the part that's about cherishing. Just cherishing this precious opportunity. Mary Oliver talks about, uh, wrote, our one wild and precious life. The Buddha exhorts us to make use of this precious opportunity. I just think of like, wow, how remarkable and incredible to be born uh, and have a life, even a hard one, uh, you know, four billion years after the planet formed, but with enough stuff that's happened that we can step outside and see flowers and breathe oxygen and see green growing things and, and have a human body with a human mind that can engage these things. Wow, including the people around us, how precious that the person next to you came into being. For all the causes and conditions in reality that manifested your friend or your cat, your white cat there, I see on the screen. Yeah, person sitting next to you, sleeping next to you or driving next to you. Wow, we can cherish others, all beings, not just human beings, all life and all everything, every grain of sand, every gopher, every galaxy. Wow, thank you. As the fruits of this kind of wide, and wide view. You might play with this. What's it like to look at your life uh, in this context, uh, particularly with a wide view of time? And then last, a very Buddhist perspective that starts with words and gradually becomes embodied, becomes felt. You feel it, you get it. In meditation and increasingly in everyday life, we can widen awareness to recognize what's continually under our nose, which is that phenomena keep changing. Thoughts and things. Changing the closer and closer you get to the present, you see that things change more, you know, just more and more rapidly. It can start to feel almost unnerving that they're changing so quickly. And it really helps to support yourself to recognize that you're still here, you're still ongoing, there's a continuity of awareness, and there's an ongoingness of arising, even as there's a, con there's a continual passing away. That can help you stay in the present. Okay. We can widen our view to recognize this continual impermanence, leading to a growing stability of neither resisting nor clinging, with a resting in equanimity, grounded in a wide view that really recognizes impermanence. This is central, certainly, to early Buddhism. And 
also it's trippy. It's a good word. The closer and closer we get to the this intensity and the velocity of ongoing change, we start to have an intuition of that which is unchanging, that which is timeless, or a kind of ground in which reality is continually unfolding. In Taoism and then Chan and Zen, there are these two aspects that are that are really emphasized that are another way, a, a simpler way of talking about what I talked about, presence and absence. The ongoingness of presence, reality unfolding, the totality of reality in a field or emerging continually out of a kind of fertile absence that has a stillness in it, or as the Buddha termed it, an unconditionality. It's unconditioned, not yet conditioned. Conditioned phenomena continually arising and passing away, changing in a field or ground, and words escape us here, that is itself unconditioned and timeless. And gradually, this widening of view can make what I'm saying here increasingly felt and apparent and, and a place of, a, of abiding, of abiding in an ongoing way for you, for you. Okay. So I've talked about different aspects of widening your view including ways in which they um, are happening in your brain and can affect your brain in positive ways, and simple practices that are available to us. That's what's so remarkable about widening the view is that it's quite easy, most of it. Um, it can be a little challenging to open to our own depth sometimes if there's pain there. We may not want to widen our view also to see everything in the world but we can really support ourselves in a practice that I think is deeply moral to, ex to widen, to recognize, for example, the suffering that we may have been unaware of or pushed out of awareness or has been hidden from us by social factors. Uh, and we can also widen our view to take into account more of other people. You know, we can do this in a way that's really down to earth and really powerful and just a profound and beautiful form of practice. So, what do you make of all this? Is my teaching conditioned or timeless? Yeah, Patricia asks. Well, the words are conditioned, and I'm a conditioned wave that's emerged from the sea 69 and a half years ago. Um, I also say I have, like many, a an intuition that transcends language of timelessness that hopefully, you know, is a factor here too. So see for yourself. Okay, let's see. I see a hand there. Um, Anya Nett, I'm going to ask you to unmute, Anya Nett. And as usual, you may have heard me say this. If you have a question or comment, please keep it kind of short and focused and make room for me to respond to it. Okay. Okay. Hi, Eric. Thank you. Um, my question is, well, the circumstance is I've been in a really wonderful chapter. Because of COVID, I moved close to my sister and she has two kids and it's been a beautiful time. Um, and recently her landlord has decided to sell the house. So she is going to be moving and they're talking about moving to Europe. My brother-in-law is European. And uh, I <laughs> have been having, I'm so sad, just a lot of hard thoughts. And my question for you is, how do you release attachment to the outcome, <laughs> which would be with sharing life with my sister? Yeah. And it, the widening helps soften it, I think. Yeah. But it still feels inauthentic to get to a place of release of outcome. 
How yeah. do you? Oh, it's very real, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. It's a, also for many, I'm sure it's a very wonderful and clear example. Um, so from a practical standpoint, and you may have heard me get into this before we began officially at 6 p.m. Pacific time, I talked about the distinction between the first arts and the second arts. This is one of the most practical parts of the Buddha's teachings. So the anticipating the loss of closeness with your sister and her family, that's a first dart. That's natural, of course you do. And we are humans, we are social. We become attached in the sense of loving others and caring about them and depending on them. So um, a foundation is to let yourself feel what you're feeling and let it be. It's okay, hopefully with qualities of compassion for yourself and kindness. Like it's because you're loving and you know loyal and invested. These are wonderful things. Because of these wonderful things, of course, there's some tears and there's some experience here. Yeah. And a lot of people run from the first dart and they use second darts to avoid feeling the first dart. And what's much better, I think, is to come back to the primary experience again and again, particularly the somatic and emotional aspects of it that are at the bottom. And sometimes we just need to do that one spoonful at a time. I emptied my own bucket of tears one spoonful at a time. You know, we touch it, we back away, we touch it, we back away. You know, that's important. Second, as a point of practice, it is possible to have normal human grief at separation experienced in a very large space of peaceful well-being. And I think that's realistically possible for us. Uh, there is no deep teaching in Buddhism that we should be indifferent to understandable pain that of course we feel. We lose a friend, we see injustice, we're angry, we're outraged about the state of the world. It, it's not, we're not supposed to become numb or uh, indifferent to it. It's okay, but this, the loss of your, you know, the closeness with your sister, the fear of the future, everything about that really can be held in a larger space. So my question for you would be, huh, can you develop a sense of perspective and a stability, you know, of an underlying peacefulness over time, gradually, over time, in which, yes, there is this sorrow, while also there is this deep peacefulness. I mean, I had a um, small skin cancer that was taken out around seven years ago. I, and before it was taken out and I knew I would be okay and I'm okay. Um, there were days where my mind kind of had three levels, honestly, and I, I think it's kind of relevant here. The top level was full of practical problem solving. What am I gonna do? The second level, I was like a, a little furry animal wanted to curl up in a corner and get hugs. You know, just scared, unhappy nervous, dread in the belly, you know, just first arts. And truly, underneath it all was just profound, boundless inner peace. That's available to us. Not because I'm special, it's available to all of us, to you. So to me, that's how I would think about the practice. And um, Yeah, I should finish just here in a second, if I could. You know, and along the way, we, we do what we can at that first level of practical problem solving of how can we stay in touch? Can you also visit them in Europe? You know, what are the details about that? You can go back and forth about that. Um, there's a place for that, sure. Uh, you know, dealing with the outer world of practical action. But meanwhile, in the inner world, uh, it's to be kind to ourselves, to let the feelings flow, to be honest 
to respect ourselves. It's normal to feel this way, even if it makes other people uncomfortable that we're gonna be sad and unhappy. Well, we have our rights. They have rights to leave. We have rights to be upset about it, <laughs> you know, right? And meanwhile, just keep doing practice that helps to widen your view about the big picture and everything and widen and increasingly ground in your own inner peace. So before I go, I wonder how how does this land on you, and what do you what do you feel or want to say here as we finish up? Mm. I, I think it will take some practice to get. Yes, <laughs> that's very wise. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and 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 there's dignity in that practice and self respect. And the Buddha said that kind of practice that you're doing is ennobling. There is a nobility in it, a quiet nobility you can stand in as you do this practice. Okay, thank you, Rick. Yeah, hang in there, really hang in there, hang in there. Uh, It can also help to take a long view. There are a lot of twists and turns in this life, including in our families. And, um, you know, over the long haul, right, there will probably be many opportunities for closeness and connection, we hope. Right? That's, re- I really need to remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can get, one thing that happens when our view is too short is we can get caught up in today or next week or this year, and it's kind of helpful to, keep lifting our gaze, like we're driving. If we just look at what's directly in front of the car, not good, but if we can look 100 feet down the road, aha, you know, we're better. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I wish you well with all this. Okay. Well, how about we just sit for a few breaths. as we widen to include a sense of ourselves and and widen to include a sense of all these others who are with us. It's nice, it's good. Well, thank you for your kindness and your practice.